Eric. Omar. <laughs> Note the dramatic pause. Those tuning in to the video side of our podcast, which it is on YouTube, okay? 80% of listeners are audio. Hi, how's it going? But there is that dominant 20% that leave the comments on the YouTube and we like to respond. And they probably will notice because we just screen record around here. We do nothing fancy. We're to the people, for the people. Something simple, clean, and precise, as Charlie Parker would say. They would note, Eric, that at the I top... Can I, can I... Go. Is it that I'm not wearing glasses in this episode? Oh, no, no, no. So I'm, I'm going to talk about your very is chiseled... Oh. that I look a little taller than the last time that we had an Iron Culture episode? So we did cover... I will say you do look a little bit more svelte, if I had to say something. And your, your, mm. your jaw's looking quite chiseled. Um, I just feel like week to week, you know how sodium can really, really mess with certain faces. Uh, this week in particular, you just look like a classical statuesque version of the Eric that I know. Um, mm. I can't quite define what that is, but you know that I can tell. They call it the uh, Neanderthal actually principle where a human can tell when there is something different. Yeah, I think I think maybe last episode it was a little bit of the uncanny valley. Like, yes. is this person really a, a human? Human? Yeah, you know. No, the, is the, it is he just wearing the glasses to appear like he has vestments of humanity? Yeah, or is this someone just a slave to a app? Yeah, you know. Yeah, like is it that, someone who's maybe propped up by science in some way? If you yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, totally. And, and I could only say that uh, sometimes when you give up literally your name for the name of the company that it now owns you, you're, you're the vessel, your soul is a vessel for a corporation. Um, it just changes everything. And we call it mm. DBE, dead behind the eyes, you know, kind of look. And everyone can identify what that is. I could just say there's a luminosity to you, a glow, Eric, a, a, a sveltness. And that is why you have... First thing I noted about my boy when I met in person, you have also a strong ass jaw. I see that there. They're represented there. I, I said this before where I said four years ago now we're in Toronto. I was joking. I said, Eric, we might get in a fight right here. And I just look, I'm like, I think this guy could take a punch. Like he has, he has the chin for sure for it. And Eric's like, please don't, please don't let us get in this situation. You know? I got the chin, but I don't have the neck, or at least at the time, I did not. <laughs> and now, I do want to say, Eric, though, what is our plausible explanation for starting this episode? And they're going to note the time. That's what I was going to mention. We were recording mm. for 50 minutes, or we were on Skype for 50 minutes before actually starting this episode. You know what? People are going to say... Yeah. That we had a whole 50 minute conversation where we we're like, all right, that was trash. We need to redo it. <laughs> but they would be wrong because mm -hmm. we would have gotten through the whole 90 minute to two hour podcast that we normally do before restarting. Yeah. That's just how we roll inefficient. Yeah. But actually, what happened for the last 50 minutes is we were just two chaps yeah. catching up because yeah. we're genuine buddies, you know, unlike <laughs> other podcasts, which may or may not attribute what they do to being by science, and I will yeah. not name any names, um, we're not propped up by a corporation, like yeah. you said. Iron Culture has and always will be until we can finally get a corporate sponsor who will pay us, but until yeah. then, we'll take the moral high road Thank you. and claim self-righteousness self and say that we are a podcast for the people, by the people. Yep. Uh, as you remember, there was a time point where we did have the owners not as the hosts. God, yeah. And we had to fire the hosts who yep. were just, you know, we realized that we had just uh, shock a lost jocks. connection to the people. Yeah, shock jocks, really. Yep. And now we as the owners are the only employees. So yep. we're essentially a collectivist commune yep. uh, of two. So, yep. uh, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not held down, not bogged down by, by the, the desire to make content that should lead to a conversion you know all this nonsense you know so yeah. yeah we're just here to provide value and i don't even mean that in the gross kind of entrepreneur way i just mean like valuable podcast <laughs> time and you're thinking eric you've just wasted all of my valuable podcast time talking about nothing and i say touche you know for the people to say you guys like the banter the five percent or whatnot like come on man uh, like you're going on too long you need to shut the fuck up because when eric gets on a roll <laughs> 
That shit is hilarious. Like it makes me, I'll put it this way. It makes me at least laugh and we're doing it. So here's the problem. Here's the problem with public access, okay? For things that aren't monetarily incentivized, such as iron culture, we literally do yes. exactly what we want. And that's both a good thing. So we get fantastic guests. We have Andrew Vygotsky on mm-hmm. and we get to do our theatrical role play with one another live in front of your steaming eyes. So you get both, you get the yin and the yang. We talk about, and we don't have, Eric, there's not a funnel around here. You know, market, some of the gross terms that have arisen in the 21st century, synergy, value, value proposition, uh, like all, all the authenticity. Like these, the, yeah. they, <laughs> when you have to create a new meaning for the word authenticity, <laughs> let me tell you what you're not. And that's authentic. Jeez. Yeah. So, no, you know what? But, but you're go, right, though. Go. We we uh, we we don't have to worry about some things that we should worry about. Yeah. Because there's not anything on the line for us. Like, for example, I have seen this comment more than once on our YouTube channel. <laughs> Omar and Eric overestimate their sense of humor and sure. how funny they are. Yeah. And I would say, no, we don't. <laughs> because if I make Omar laugh, I have succeeded. And if Omar makes me laugh, he has succeeded. And that's about 95% of, of what we care about and how we rank success in terms of our humor. Yeah. So it's not that we've overestimated our humor. It's that we undervalue the sense of humor of everyone who listens, who is probably funnier than us. Yeah. And we just force you to stick around until we talk about the thing you actually want to hear about, uh, which uh, is, you know, today's topic. Yeah, we. It, it, it's I something about something. This. It's lift. It's it's lifting related. Look, last episode we had that slight schedule uh, change. We had the fire episode with you on the carnivore diet, and now today we're playing both sides. We see a little bit of you know talking about the diet, talking about the Joe Rogan, and we're flipping it right back now to lifting exercise, but also as it relates to nutrition. We're talking about manipulating volume well cutting. We're talking about a lot of different things here today, Eric. Omar. Hmm. Hmm. I yes. thought last episode we talked about peak week science. That's the memory I have. Also, Weird. you looked a little paler. Yeah. And yeah. Did you shave? Uh I did. My squat was really strong last week though. I don't know if you saw oh, it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I it was not. I was just like by by you know, forty more percent. Like I was squatting. 600 pounds like it was nothing and wider stance than you normally do right my hips my hips sometimes i wake up and they're achy sometimes those adductors i whoosh, i just mm. sink right down yeah yeah well you know oddly enough i didn't know this is even possible but you also looked more jolly Thank last you. time we were on and yeah. i think you're a jolly a, a jolly guy in general sure it's hard to say jo- jolly guy in general <laughs> that's a lot of jgs mm. uh and what it, what was the word i kept saying uh there was I, I reckon or something. There was like a, a slight Southern drawl that some people yeah. accuse me as like, Omar, what is this caricature you're doing? And I said, I'm literally from North Carolina. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I found it a little offensive since I know you're literally from Toronto. <laughs> sure. But, um, but you know, as someone from California who lives in New Zealand, I didn't really have any ground to stand on. So, uh, so anyway, we'll just move forward. Like Omar said, folks, uh, t- the, the topic du jour that we've taken all of your valuable time uh, and wasted to get to. Hopefully you just fast forwarded to this point and this is where the timestamp is. It is. Um, is going to be, what do we do with volume mm-hmm. while we're cutting? And uh, this is one of those oft debated uh, topics that I'll be honest with you, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna bury the lead. Omar, when I see people debate this, I almost start eye rolling before people even talk about it because more often than not, people tend to have a very reductionist view of this and end up not being able to see the multifaceted aspects of this. And they, they're kind of missing out on some of the, the basic principles, which I think we can get into. Eric, surely you're not trying to imply that in fitness there is a level of reductionism that actually lowers the overall fidelity. And there's definitely not a false dichotomy between two different things, like maybe intensity and volume and which one should one try and pursue or emphasize when cutting. Like These aren't the conversations you're talking about, right? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't state that about the entire fitness industry. I think that would be too reductionist of a statement, Omar. Thank you. Sorry. I apologize for that. So, so, so then for yourself, Eric, when we open up this conversation, because th- this is something, what, the last decade, right? Yeah. Uh, people have been discussing it. And we're at a, a certain point now where we have enough information that we can make some uh, qualified assessments and we're gone are the vestiges of the past. Let's say, what, 20 years ago, 
uh, when we first started training, not 20 years ago, but when we came from a culture that a lot of things being a spouse at that time, you would hear things probably, I'm sure uh, you heard it too, like, oh, you're trying to lose weight, young buck. Like, you got to do higher repetitions, right? They're going to either cut up the muscles or like there is, there's a recognition that maybe there needs to be a change when losing weight. But that approach was kind of anecdotal. What someone else heard someone else was doing or someone else that got great results, what they were doing was the initial kind of uh, uh, advice being given 20 years ago. And then there was that overhaul of like, well, wait a second, like, why are we actually doing this in the first place? You said, like, Bob got jacked getting this. This is the rationale behind why I should be following your advice. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely where, I mean, when I first got into the industry, people were kind of like, hey, you know, like, there's our massing time in the off season. Now we're cutting. It's time to get cut up. Yeah. So we're going to do things like essentially turn our weight training into fat loss training. So let's up the reps, um, which could have a rationale anywhere from something more plausible, like this will be, you know, more total energy expenditure, which is true. If you're doing sets of 20 versus sets of 10, it's going to be total higher volume load just from physics. You're going to burn more calories. Does that result in more total daily energy expenditure? Maybe not because you're just more tired after the workout, so you move less and you're also dieting. Um, and then the other, you know, less plausible uh, explanation is just kind of this magic hand waving of if you do higher reps, it, it makes your muscles more cut. Mm -hmm. um, that's just cutting muscles up. And it makes me think that sounds dangerous. I don't know what that means. Um, so that obviously, I don't think any, any Iron Culture listeners are, are thinking that high reps are some kind of independently of energy balance changing muscle shape or, or contour or striation. So that's, that's of course not happening. Yeah. And then, so then the question has be become like, well, all right, so how do we adjust training based on the fact that we're trying to retain muscle? And ever since volume has taken a centerpiece in this conversation, people have been relatively confused about that because kind of the, one of the, the, the fitness memes that you'll hear is volume is a quote unquote primary driver of hypertrophy. Yeah. And okay, well, if I want to maintain my muscle, then should I increase my volume while, while cutting? You know, and I think that is typically one of those. And the other one is, hey, we should just cut volume as far back as we can and just do the least amount to maintain because of recovery is impeded. And I think those both operate on two ends of a spectrum that are probably too reductionist and too extreme. The fitness industry encapsulated volume being a key driver for hypertrophy. Surely we haven't heard that before. Maybe I did say that in fact in 2015. Who knows? I think uh, the nature of this conversation, people recognize at the very least that you are changing one thing with certainty. That is a reduction in overall calories. And there even even that's a conversation that I'm sure we're going to get to is the amount the deficit uh, has will help determine also your course of action. So that that's something that's also being tweaked. But they recognize at least from the outset that, OK, I'm going to have fewer total calories. What does that therefore mean? Does it mean that the things that theoretic, uh, theoretically will preserve my muscle? So let's say if they believe that increasing volume does so, that maybe I should keep doing that. And then on the other hand, it's like, well, what's the consideration then where I might my recovery might be impaired? So they recognize, at least from the outset, that there is an issue or there might need to be an adjustment in terms of their training, depending upon the deficit and the severity. But the course of action seems a little unclear, depending upon who they speak to. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I was mostly just starting with some of the reductionist kind of partially correct, partially incorrect views in the training side. Mm. But you are just as correct that the same thing happens on the nutrition side. And then there's the interaction of the two, which is yeah. where these in these 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 problematic kind of uh, two singular arguments take 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 shape and where these people talking across each other in the space occur. So you're 100 percent right. Typically, people see a deficit as a state of being rather than like you said operating on a continuum of well how large is the deficit how lean are you getting and then how does that interact with training are you training on all the days you're in a deficit are you training the days after like there are there's a there's a level of of uh of, of independent effect and then there's also an interdependent effect of how the two affect one each other right so yeah i think for, for that's probably the easiest thing that we can just kind of step away from being in a calorie deficit is not this novel state of being. It has cumulative effects depending upon its quality, right? So we've talked about low energy availability. I think a decent way of conceptualizing the effects of an energy deficit 
are to look at both acute and chronic energy availability. So if you are, let's say, really high in body fat, but you go on a starvation diet, that's going to affect you differently than if you're lean and you go on a starvation diet. The latter is probably going to have a larger impact because you just simply can't metabolize as much body fat for fuel to replace, quote unquote, that deficit. Um, you rely on different fuel sources to some degree. You start breaking down more body proteins and muscle glycogen for energy when you are lean because there's simply less fat available, right? So you start to see negative effects more quickly when your quote unquote chronic energy availability, your body fat level is low if you are also dieting hard. Uh, and then that scales. So like if you're very high in body fat, you can get away with a higher deficit. Some things are gonna be impacted, right? If you're trying to do resistance training on a large deficit and you're on a low carb diet, like you're gonna have some, some substrate issues. You know, your, your intensity might be limited to some degree. Um, and that could be an argument for lowering volume. But you don't have to be on a huge energy deficit, right? So energy availability is basically like how much energy in a kind of flux state do I have for the things I'm trying to do, both my physiological function as well as my exercise. And we talked about this uh, in, in the podcast episode where we discussed uh, overtraining and how it is potentially confounded uh, or affected by low energy availability and the relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, and that collectively describes like when your energy intake is less than you need for the exercise you're doing uh, plus physiological function, which typically happens around a certain mathematical threshold you can actually calculate that is very individual. But um, like when we look at se sedentary women, for example, when they're less than uh, 30 kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass, they more often start to see a, a disruption of menstrual cycle. That's just an example. But it's, you know, hypothalamus mediated effects on the whole body, right? So I know you're going to see changes in the leptin, you're going to see changes in the therefore downstream effects on thyroid function, immune suppression, bone health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, testosterone reductions. Uh, so you're going to have sexual, metabolic, immunological health d decline if you're in a, a state of very low energy availability. And that also depends on how long are you there for, you know? So if you're doing a, a fast, th like four week mini cut, in a state of low energy availability when you're moderately high in body fat, you might just notice like, oh, I can't do quite as much volume and I'm tired a little bit. However, if you've been doing that for 24 weeks to get into stage shape, you're gonna feel like, you know, like compressed dog poop, you know? <laughs> so not even uncompressed no more. So, so yeah, the, 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 the status of a deficit uh, should, should not be viewed as an on and off switch, which I think is something that people often uh, will think about. Like, what about if I'm in a deficit? Okay, the whole premise now, your your con your conception's a, a little off. And there there is not a one size fits all answer whether you are on or off, you know, a, a calorie surplus or deficit. So that that's 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 the first thing to consider. Um, and if you think about this mechanistically, immediately after a meal of of a reasonable size, if you're in let's say a, a moderate deficit, like a 500 calorie deficit, you're actually probably storing some body fat. Like if you're having four meals a day eating 2,500 calories, you normally need to maintain weight on 3,000 calories. That's still like a, a 600 to 700 calorie meal each time you sit down. That's more than your acute energy needs. So some of it gets stored and then a couple hours goes by and you start tapping into that. So there's the, the net change over time that dictates whether you have, you know, a sufficient energy availability or you're going to be losing weight, right? And the same thing is true in a surplus. Like let's say, okay, again, same person, 3,000 calorie maintenance. Let's say you're on 3,300 calories. You're in a 10% surplus, right? If you're in the middle of the night at, at 4 a.m. and you have not eaten for six hours, you are tapping into body fat stores. You are losing some body fat, but you are gaining fat in other parts of the day, and the net change is probably a slight increase in body fat along with the muscle you're hopefully primarily gaining. So neither one of these states is just a, a light switch on or off constant effect. It is a uh, cumulative effect over each one of these meals over time and that we're seeing a steady degradation or improvement in your recovery based upon, you know, whether you're in a surplus or deficit. So that's, that's how we need to view nutrition. Um, and we do know, and we talked about this in the episode on fatigue, Omar, if you remember that, uh, where, we, where we touched on how nutritional status and various components of it uh, can impact fatigue, right? So it's not unreasonable, the kind of the the, the, the oversimplification of like, hey, there's no such thing as, as, as under recovery, you know, there's just under eating, right? 
No such thing as overtraining, just just under eating, right? So that's that's not a hundred percent false, because certainly if you're if you're in a state of low energy availability, chronically and acutely, and it scales over time, that is going to degrade your ability to recover from training. So that is probably the, like the first step towards us having a more nuanced understanding of what's the effect of the diet, and then just understanding that it scales with all those things I talked about till this point. Yeah, Eric, I, I was not trying to leapfrog uh, two or three steps in advance. It just becomes immediately obvious, depending mm. upon the severity of said deficit, will directly impact the considerations one must have, and as you said, the interdependence. And I'll just throw one more wrench before we, we get into the actual topic or, or the notion of what one should do with regards to training, and that is, what's the intended function, like the end outcome that you desire? Like, are you a strength athlete? If you're a strength athlete, so it's like vol if we're talking about uh, uh, training manipulations while in a deficit, okay, are you someone that cares exclusively just about your total? That is a different conversation than if you care about preserving the preservation of as, uh, of as much fat-free mass as possible. Absolutely. And most of the time, um, when you're looking to be in a deficit as a strength athlete, it is typically for a cyclical short phase prior to competition as you make weight. Uh, a common occurrence is say, let's say someone is competing in the, let's say a woman in the 76 kilo class, right? They may walk around at 80, 81 kilos, and they know that they can drop to say 78 kilos from just uh, gut weight and water manipulation alone. And that's primarily what they do, but that means they need to drop another two plus kilos from body fat right? And at a, at a, at a you know, reasonable pace, that might be a six to eight week process just to make sure the training is not impacted too much. And this is happening during the peaking phase, typically. Right. So they're not doing a lot of volume. And if they happen to lose a little bit of weight from fat-free mass, but their total is still going the direction they want while dropping weight, they're not going to be like, oh no, my precious biceps. They, like they, that, that's, not, that's not a consideration, right? Yeah. The consideration is, is my total where I want it to be or where it should be or where it's historically been? And did I make weight, right? On the other hand, uh, when we're talking about a competitive bodybuilder or someone who is interested in aesthetics, and that's the whole reason they're dieting, yeah. um, they are trying to preserve as much muscle mass as possible because that's going to have the direct impact on, on what their, their appearance is. So, and that, I think that's where people get confused. Like, no one would argue that you need to do like more triples when you start dieting versus not. <laughs> true, you know? true. Um, but you do have people who would suggest that, hey, you know, like we mentioned, that that kind of oversimplification of you know volume is a primary driver of, of muscle growth. Uh, therefore, you know, when when I'm dieting and the signal is against muscle growth, I need to increase the signal for muscle growth. Like it's it's actually kind of viewing the effects of training in a singular fashion rather than understanding it in a two-factor model. So we talked about the two-factor model before, again, back in that fatigue episode. And that's the idea that training has two effects. It produces fitness and it produces fatigue. Yeah. And for the people who generally are like, yeah, you need to increase volume or dieting, which is not a whole lot of people, but I've heard it enough sure. um, that the... The, the way they view it is more volume equals more gains. And then dieting makes it harder to make gains, therefore I need to do more volume. But it's just this linear, continuous, ever-growing single factor that, that somehow doesn't produce fatigue. Yeah. And they're not considering that fatigue might be modified by the diet itself. So obviously that's that's not the way to view it. Yeah. So there there are several wrenches, but we're, we're going to get the conversation because I, I, I think... From the outset, it might seem like this conversation is uh, pretty straightforward, but then you start going down the various rabbit holes and you see that there are these considerations. The final thing I want to say, uh, Eric, is just sometimes uh, when individuals will ignore the starting point for someone of their cut or of their deficit, like what were they doing beforehand? Was it actually work? Because we're trying to talk, we're trying to quantify, okay, what was your training like? Was it successful? And then what will we do if we're to adjust then your calories? So we're putting you in deficit, let's say like 200 calories for like however we're trying to find it. But what you were doing before, if we can, can we assume that what you were doing before, A, was 
optimal. There's no such thing as being optimal. But was it within a range that was acceptable for you so that we could use best practices moving forward, that prior data to make an informed choice in the future? Or is this a situation, as we'll see, where like maybe were you even doing the right thing to set it up? And then as we are in a more restricted framework, we'll discover even more about you. I I, I don't think we could just flat out assume that every single person, especially you being a coach, if you, someone gets brought on board with you, and you don't know what their prior training history is, you can't automatically assume that whatever they're doing before this deficit was the thing for them. No, I think that that's 100% like really important considerations. And yeah, this is, uh, like you said, there's a lot of wrenches. And <laughs> and, and as the great theologian said, uh, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. And <laughs> here at Iron Culture, we're going to help you catch each wrench and evaluate it Sure. Um, if you don't catch it, you will get hit in the head, and that will probably do some permanent damage. <laughs> but I'm going to try not to throw any of these wrenches at you too quick. Sure. And I'm making sure it all, all, all this information can fit in your brain. So we've established one deficit, not not a single factor, right? It, it has qualities to it. Uh, how lean are you getting? How lean did you start? Um, how long have you been doing it? And how high is that deficit? Those things are all affecting the sliding scale of how much is this impacting recoverability because it's going to produce fatigue potentially early on in the deficit when you're actually not that lean and you can still eat a lot of calories you're not in a state below maybe whatever your threshold is for energy availability i would suspect you can handle the normal amount of training volume or something very similar to it that you would handle in the off season right okay but let's talk about when you get to that point where your recovery is impacted and this is where that kind of single factor let's focus on the fitness side of training folks would say, oh, well, I'm, I'm now having an anti-hypertrophy signal, so I need to increase my volume. That seems directly counter to understanding that, okay, now our recovery is impeded in some way, okay? And this is where the other voice stems from. The other end of the spectrum of the argument is really focused on the fatigue side of it and, and, and the effect of the diet rather than on the fitness side of the equation and the effect of training. So the argument from this one typically goes something like this. Hey, we've got research on untrained individuals uh, where they're doing, you know, like one ninth of their training volume and they maintain muscle mass for the length of the study that they were observed. Uh, therefore, if I just want to maintain my muscle mass, which is the goal during a diet, then I should cut my volume down to minimal levels, like minimum effective dose. And uh, then I won't have this, you know, catabolic effect. I'll be as sufficient to, to counteract this catabolic effect. I can maintain my muscle mass and I can just focus on fat loss. And I would say that's a, at face value, more reasonable proposition than let's just increase volume while dieting. Um, and we'll get to why for both. So, so first, let's, let's really think of something super logical that I don't have to explain any kind of studies for you of why increasing volume doesn't really make sense. So let's say you did increase volume while dieting and that actually gave you a benefit. You maintained more muscle than last time. All that tells me is that you were doing too low a volume in your off season prior to that. When, when you had more recu recuperative capacities and you're just like, like, what were you doing in the off season? If you can handle more volume in a less recovered state, then that's what you should have been doing in the off season. And then it would probably scale down. So that to me is just apparently obvious. Um, but now let's talk about the other side of it. Can we cut volume down to, to one ninth or one third or, or some of these other values like to, to minimal levels and expect to, to maintain all our muscle mass as someone who is, you know, like a competitive bodybuilder or someone who has similar relatively extreme goals? And I would say it depends on how long, the severity of the diet and all that good stuff. But it's probably not just, again, deficit's not just an on or off switch, something you should just automatically do and just slash it right away. Um, so there are data that suggest that muscle maintenance, much like muscle growth, probably scales to training age. Like what you need to gain muscle when you have never lifted before is anything in the weight room, right? Because it is infinitely more weight, more intensity, more volume, more frequency, literally mathematically infinitely from doing zero. Uh, any number is an infinite, infinite increase. So once you are, when you're a novice, yeah, you get in the gym, once a week you start lifting weights and you're gonna see good gains, right? Doesn't take much. However, that will lead to a relatively quick plateau and you'll have to do more. Uh, and I'm not saying that the amount you have to do or the stimulus you have to do and all 
elements of that stimulus scale with training age. Yes, indeed, in my anecdotal observations, I find that most people have an individual volume point uh, that is sufficient to allow them to progress, which we've talked about before in iron culture. And it's not like, you know, intermediate version of you versus advanced version of you is 10 times more sets. I don't think that's the case. Um, but certainly novice version of you and what was required to produce, uh, you know, measurable hypertrophy versus, you know, after the novice phase, those are two different volume levels. And I don't think many people would, would disagree with that. So if it takes more to actually grow muscle, you would think that it would also take more than what it took for you to initially grow muscle when you're a novice to maintain it when you're a later stage lifter. And there are data that support that. So there are a number of, and these aren't super like high hierarchical evidence scale pieces of data, but I think they are important and they are something that should give us pause. So there's a number of studies. Uh, there's one uh, by, by Basler and colleagues. Uh, jumping performance is preserved, but not muscle thickness in collegiate volleyball players after a taper. And that kind of says it right there. So we're looking at regularly strength training, NCAA volleyball athletes, who you could argue are power athletes. Uh, and they did a taper prior to competition, and they actually saw some decrements in ultrasound measured, measured muscle thickness while preserving and actually improving performance. And a taper is, yes, it's a reduction in volume, but if you look at like an NCAA athlete's taper, you're not thinking, whew, that's a muscle loss program. You know, you wouldn't think that, right? Um, likewise, there's also some studies that are more appropriate, arguably, on uh, weightlifters. There's a study by Suarez and colleagues that looked at, I think, around 10 uh, weightlifters. And they weren't even looking at the taper necessarily. They were looking at an overall block periodized plan. So they looked at, and this is a 2019 study, I'll just give the titles, people can look it up if they want, phase specific changes in rate of force development and muscle morphology throughout a block periodized training cycle in weightlifters. So what they looked at was this block periodized model where they had like a volume block, a strength block, and then a taper. And they actually compared like the, I think they called it a power strength phase. Uh, and, and they looked at that compared to other phases. And this is, this is not a taper, so it's, it's lower volume, but it's not low volume, and it was high load. So this is an example of preserving or increasing intensity and dropping volume. Uh, and they actually saw a decrease again in, 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 muscle, in, in measurements of muscle size during this phase where they had decreased their volume a little bit, an overall periodized plan, okay? So this isn't even a huge decrease in volume, it's just a decrease in volume. And then finally, Travis and colleagues had a, uh, a case series of two weightlifters preparing for a national championship and similar findings that when during their taper, they actually saw some reductions in markers for muscle size. Now, big caveat, Omar, is that these measurements uh, were primarily, if I recall correctly, with ultrasound. Hmm. So if there is a reduction in, in muscle water, it's just a measure of thickness or cross-sectional area, right? So if this is potentially non-myofibular protein losses due to doing less total volume, maybe having less swelling and edema from doing less volume and training, you know, with, with higher rep ranges and, and things that are more metabolically taxing. It could be that they didn't actually lose any force producing muscle, right? However, that, that doesn't really matter for a bodybuilder. And I'm also not super confident that I can say for sure that they didn't lose any of that muscle. Uh, because just because you got stronger doesn't mean that you couldn't have lost muscle because there's so many factors that, that go into strength. You can 100% get better at the skill of lifting while losing a little bit of muscle and the net result will be increasing strength. So all I'm saying is that the data on untrained or not that well-trained individuals and how little they can get away with without losing muscle doesn't perfectly align with the data on strength trained athletes like weightlifters or NCAA volleyball players. Um, and there are indications that holding on to all your muscle mass when you're a pretty highly trained individual um, is probably going to require more than your, your maintenance program might look like a like a hard program for someone who is new. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Eric, that is very well said, especially because I do think one of the memes that has arisen over the last probably seven to eight years when you try and have this cross pollination between different fields would be uh, the blending in of some strength adages uh, in terms of like, oh, if your total goes up or if you maintain your total, you're maintaining your muscle, right? your muscle mass. And that's like just a, a blanket statement that is kind of accepted in the community. I'd say if like you're mm -hmm. uh, a power building inclined or, or strength focused, or maybe you're a, a muscle bound hunk that does know, you know, what their squat bench and deadlift is. But that's kind of like a general heuristic. 
But as we'll probably, as uh, you just uh, uh, hinted at, that is not necessarily the case at all. The, the two are separate. Like strength is a skill. It is the express, uh, expression uh, that you do through uh, certain movements. And you can get, even in a deficit, you could maintain your strength, maybe even get stronger depending on so many other factors. And you could, especially the duration, severity, and everything else of the fat loss phase, lose some muscle mass over that time. Like it, it is possible. And that notion that it was possible while doing those things uh, was kind of like uh, soundly rebuked by a large, I say, contingent of the community because that was viewed as uh, not being sensible. This is like, what are you talking about? You're using like these big compound movements. And I even remember this is more around the uh, most minimalist approach, which immediately didn't ring true to me. Like in 2014, I won't name the person, but a prominent strength coach that said so much so that because these are the big compound movements, movements, you want to emphasize them when you're trying to lose weight. And the thing is like bicep curls and the things for your little muscle groups, they're not nearly as important because they're basically getting worked indirectly by the squat bench and deadlift. <laughs> and I could only shudder to imagine if like someone who's interested in both of these pursuits followed unequivocally one of these talking heads just dumped completely, let's say, any of their work for uh, muscle groups that aren't really stimulated with some of these compound movements. And if you were just to take like a before and after man of like the start of their phase, let's say phallus phase is 12 to 16 weeks and after, and they're like, oh, my biceps got smaller. And the coach is like, no, no, no. I mean, that's just perspective. Right? Like, yeah, like fat there. So like you lost weight there. So like, yeah, you look smaller, but like you've totally kept all your muscle. And the answer is like, no, 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 I didn't. Yeah, 100%. And it's it's one of those statements that's almost true. Yeah. And the, the true version of it is that I have only lost an amount of muscle, which could be zero, by the yeah. way, or maybe even a negative number, i.e. you've gained muscle, yeah. to prevent a loss of strength yeah. or to uh, that it was insufficient to result in a strength loss, yeah. right? And if you're one of the people who does the whole preserve or increase intensity while dropping volume, this could actually mask muscle losses rather than be preventing it, yeah. right? So if you're doing sets of, you know, 8 to 12, and then you start doing sets of 6 to 8, um, but you cut your sets in, in a third or down to a third, um, I would not be surprised if at least initially you started to get a little bit stronger because you're training with heavier loads. Um, and then you, but, but, but still could be losing a little bit of muscle mass depending on how long and how hard you're dieting and all that good stuff. And I, I don't want to sound alarmist. No. Um, that's, it's not what I'm trying to get across here. I just want people to have a better understanding of this so that they don't fall on one of the two ends of the extremes where automatically they cut their volume in half when they start dieting or automatically they, they increase their volume to something slightly higher when they start dieting to offset muscle losses. Cause I don't think either one of those automatic decisions really makes sense. Um, so, some things we've established, uh, and, and also just to, to, to totally agree with you there, if you were to try to go, okay, what's the best performance proxy for muscle gain? It would actually be the lowest skill movement. You know, like, like if you look at the research mm. with what, not, not the squat bench or deadlift, right? Because those are complex movements, which you can get better at, and the skill of lifting is something that should not be underestimated with how much it can affect it. But if you were to say like, like, like a machine curl and yeah. that's going down while your bench is going up, I would not be surprised if, if, you're, if you're losing some, some muscle mass, at least your biceps, right? Because yeah. when we look at cross-sectional relationships between muscles, uh, or sorry, markers for muscle hypertrophy and strength, the strongest measurements are when we do things like isokinetic dynamometry uh, or specifically isometric contractions where we've not eliminated, but removed as much of the skill component as we can while still having a measure, measure of muscle force, right? So yeah, the, the more complex, the more technical a, uh, a movement, the more it can be independently improved by changes in technique, kind of not, not regardless, but as a, high, a greater factor than, than changes in, in muscle size. Eric, that, so that actually blew my mind and that makes complete sense when you said that. You'd want to take as a proxy, if anything, the least skilled movement yeah. No, no, that what you just explained makes complete sense. Yeah. So th this is like, you know, good news, bad news, depending upon your perspective, <laughs> yeah. right? The, the, the power lifter is, is probably going, oh, shit, that means I've maybe maybe improved my squat bench and deadlift, but at a slightly slower rate while dieting and I could have lost muscle. But then you kind of go like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You improved your squat bench and deadlift. Sure, right? sure. <laughs> And so long as you're not and always in a perpetual state of cutting or you're not always having to get down to a weight class that is maybe a, a couple kilos too far. Uh, that that's pre preventing you from long-term increasing your strength to where it could be, then that's not a big deal. 
another thing to consider, like, especially in the context of bodybuilding, like I compete at like 80 kilos, Omar. And right now I'm like 94, 95. How strong should I expect a 10 to 14 kilo lighter version of me to be, even if I maintain all my muscle mass? Yeah. So like, it's, it's difficult to compare between individuals, but like, let's say, let's say for example, we compare, uh, like the, the middleweight classes of powerlifting, you know, we compare, you know, the, the 83, the 93. And like, when you compare these weight class and the 74, and like when you compare these weight classes, the majority of the people at a high level are reasonably lean, but there's still a difference, you know, like the, the, the total scale. Yeah. Except for Taylor Atwood, who just is unreasonably <laughs> strong. But for everyone else, yeah. you know, you you have like the each champion is a step up on the rung as you as you move up. You know, you're you're getting close to a 900 kilo total at at 93. You're in a mid 800s at 83, and then you're a pro, you're around 800 at uh, at 74 um, for your 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 stock standard kind of elite level lifter, and they're all pretty lean. So the, the you have to think about it like. W- there is some degree of physics going on here that's independent of how much muscle mass I maintain. So anyway, um, there is probably some obligatory losses in lean mass that may not even be muscle mass as well that you add to that. Uh, so it's it's a tough thing to parse out as to whether or not I'm losing muscle mass. And most of the time when I look at it as a coach, I'm simply assessing visual performance and and those two things combined are, are, are what I'm focused on. Um, so it's it's... It's really because for a bodybuilder, it's what do you look like? And for an athlete, it's how am I performing? And the other one can be a proxy for the effectiveness of the muscle mass, but you primarily focus on the one you care about. So like if I have a bodybuilder who's looking better and better and better and looks amazing, but he's getting weaker everywhere, I'm thinking, yeah, this is probably psychological, but it's not, uh, it doesn't matter yet. Like we're still <laughs> looking amazing. Yeah. You know, you might be sandbagging it or, or just the fatigue is getting to your head, which is actually a very common thing in first time competitors. Um, you just... Like you feel like trash grabbing the dumbbells or walking out a squat. You might be able to do just as many reps. It just feels worse yeah. and it doesn't feel safe. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like you have to wear your, your, uh, your, your hoodie for your belt, your, your belt to fit the same way, you know? So like, I remember my first season, my numbers tanked a lot in bodybuilding. And the next time I dieted, they didn't tank nearly as much. And in 2019, I preserved my strength for like, seven out of the eight months and then it just started to slightly go down and i it's possible that my body is just more resilient to these dieting uh factors and you know like i'm getting a quote unquote like muscle memory of ability to maintain muscle mass while dieting that wouldn't surprise me if that was some kind of epigenetic change in people who chronically diet (laughs) um i could see that being helpful from a survival standpoint but if i had to put money on it just for kind of my psychology, physiology, reading a lot of research, coaching a lot, like my, my, my gut guess on what's the primary factor, it's getting more used to what it feels like to diet and having a better gauge of, of when does this feeling really correlate with reduced performance and am I willing to just simply feel shittier and try harder to get the same stimulus and training. Um, and that, that takes experience. Eric, so one of the things I think, because, you know, I'm joking when I say this, but you and myself were spendthrift boys. And then we got someone like uh, Alberto Nunez, where the same per. So this is why it all comes down to the individual. Would it necessarily be a good proxy for us uh, strength as a measurement tool if we haven't established before what is probably the expected degradation? Because for us, I'm just coming up with this example, but for us to get lean, I've never been very lean, but you've gotten lean. To get to that point, the calorie deficit we're in is actually markedly different than someone like an Alberto who can survive on relatively higher calories. Do we not think that that would uh, not impair his performance as much? So you're assuming like, okay, like on like on average or whatnot, someone should on a 20% deficit, like more or less. So therefore, it's a good proxy. They can maintain their strength. And then there's us who are like, we're, we're on that like sub 2000 calories getting leaner looking better but like yeah you know so the bench press for us like that we know that's the gold standard for the upper body movement if we're maintaining that it means that we're maintaining our muscle mass and that's tanking because guess what we're in a pretty big deficit on the other hand our man alberto it's like oh like what did what did he do four or five weeks out he's like i'm gonna compete in a powerlifting meet i'm like the what and the who it's like is this necessarily for all situations in all cases the best measurement or is it a useful metric understanding the context contextual uh as it is 
And then other things to your point, like just very quickly, completely anecdotal for my part, but when uh, I got your assistance, when you were coaching me in 2019, when I did get uh, decently lean, I took some of those dietary breaks. One of the things I did change was the mental emphasis on the numbers. And for me, just personally, like without getting again to the rabbit hole and me using my one example as actually the meta example for everyone is just focusing more on then proximity to failure and the overall, like the total amount of work that I was doing, the quality of said work, because I know there is that theoretical threshold for me where strength will go down in absolute sense. I'll maintain, you know, like relative strength and it's cool, but that's not as motivating also uh, too. And I can have uh, someone else. uh, So uh, let's say a a friend who's also losing weight, relatively same uh, training experience on a higher amount of calories and their ability to maintain uh, their strength is better, but we're both basically maintaining or retaining the same amount of relative muscle mass. So it feels like something's happening psychologically t- uh, to yourself where you're taking a look and you're like, oh my God, like I'm getting weaker, Eric, it's not working. It's like, well, hold on now. That's not telling you the full picture. Yeah, those are yeah two really good points there. The, the one about individual differences and how some people are just less negatively affected by diets. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some people might think, well, well, what's the, you know, isn't Birdo just in the same size of a deficit getting just as lean, but he just has to eat or he's a lot, he can eat higher calories to get there. And I would say yes, but you also have to think of why can he eat higher calories? And it's because there's less physiological disruption from the diet that is reducing energy expenditure, at least theoretically, that's what we think is happening. Uh, and this could be described as, you know, a higher quote unquote, or sorry, a lower quote unquote, like body fat set point, which is probably better described as the the dual intervention model, which is basically like, at what point does your body make physiological changes to prevent weight gain? And at what point does your body make physiological changes to prevent weight loss? Um, and for someone who is uh, thrifty but not spend thrift, like like your two co-hosts here, um, that means that they can get into a deficit, they're dropping body fat, and they don't see those uh, that, that, that bottom dual intervention factor hit them until maybe they're really lean, yeah. you know? And it's only at that point that they really start to feel pretty beat up. So I will say that pretty much everyone eventually is crushed by a contest prep diet. <laughs> but uh, it, it might be for a shorter time period. Um, you know, Berto also has to be careful about muscle loss, though. Yeah. You know, because he has such a high energy expenditure and he'll notice he'll flatten out real quick. Um, so, and, and he can see negative effects on performance. So it's not like just being a, a hamster on, on a wheel is, is always a positive thing. Um, but nonetheless, I think on the mental fatigue side of it, which you were talking about, which is, can be very psychological, that can have an impact as well. Yeah. Um, and I'm also glad you brought up, uh, proximity to failure, which was something you focused on because one of the arguments you'll, you'll, you'll typically see on the let's reduce volume, uh, kind of side of it is, Hey, it's the load on the bar, the actual tension Mm -hmm. that is the stimulus that, that actually preserve muscle mass. And this is actually not, not the load on the bar, but the bar, but the tension aspect that, that is true. You know why we were, we were making fun of the, the concept of volume being the primary driver for hypertrophy. That's uh, just too incomplete of a statement. The tension is the actual stimulus that is producing hypertrophy. Volume is how much of that stimulus you provide. That's why should I do more volume or intensity is a, a nonsense question. Or is, what, what's more important, volume or intensity? One is describing the, the quantity of the other. So it's like, you know, what's more important, quantity or quality? Like, well, how do I answer that? You know, they're they're two different things. In this case, two factors of the same thing. It's like saying, hey, is it the music or the volume of the music? I'm like, what do you what do you mean? (laughs) Like, (laughs) how loud do you need the music to be? But you can't have a volume without music. Right. So anyway, um, so I think for the folks who are out there who are focusing on like the quote unquote intensity and dropping volume, they're maybe taking the argument too far to the other side. They're thinking, okay, well, if tension is all that matters and my recovery is down, then I just need to do a little bit of heavy lifting. And for, for one, it's, it's not the, the, the load necessarily, but it is like you said, it's the proximity to failure because you end up at the same point, whether you do sets of 20 or sets of 10 or sets of six, if the, if it has a sufficient intensity, or I should say a sufficient uh, effort per set. If, if you're getting into a reasonable distance to failure where it's actually a quote unquote hard set, then that set's going to have an effect. So you don't need to increase your rep range uh, or decrease your rep range when dieting, but you do need to ensure that the sets you are doing are still effective. But how many total sets should you do? Well, that's going to be dependent upon your recuperative capacities, which is going to scale with the diet. So 
we're kind of actually getting home to to an answer. But I think before I just start laying out, like, here's here's my thoughts on this. Yeah. I think people need to understand, like, what are the effects of a deficit? Um, okay, sure, I'm with you, Eric. It's not an on or off switch. But I think some people just think they don't understand what's what does a deficit actually do? Like, why do I lose muscle mass on a deficit? Sure. And, and, and we have some gross level mechanistic data on this. So, for example, uh, Hector and colleagues back in 2018, what they did was they took individuals and they put them on a diet and they had them lift weights. And they noticed that their baseline protein synthesis response to meals decreased. So people often think like, oh, if I don't eat, it's catabolic. Or if I'm eating less or if I'm on a diet, it's catabolic. And it's like sort of. It's actually like anti anabolic is probably a better way of seeing it. And to some degree, lifting weights can rescue that response a little bit. So lifting weights amplifies the protein th the synthetic response, right? So it, it, it partitions more of the protein and gives you a higher peak that is then moved towards creating new muscle proteins. And that can offset that drop in muscle protein synthesis that you see from dieting. Um, and this is this has you know been, been shown a number of times, but I think Hector is uh, the the one I'm aware of that, that's coming to mind right now, 2018. But essentially, what that means is if you take someone who's not lifting weights and they start dieting, you have a normal response to meals that contain protein, where you have an increase in synthesis and then a drop, and then at least you know until like late stage middle age, if you're inactive, that's going to be sufficient to maintain your current level of untrained muscle, right? If you start dieting, and we see this in people who do cyclical yo-yo dieting, you actually lose muscle along with fat. You're like losing 60% fat, 40% muscle. And that can sometimes be a, a negative net thing if you then regain that weight quickly. Uh, it's the issue with with, with yo-yo dieting, right? Without weight training. Um, so weight training in, allows those peaks to stay higher and preserves the vast majority of muscle mass. In an untrained person, you can actually gain muscle mass while dieting because of that. Um, However, that does change throughout the course of the diet. So we also have Hector, sorry, we also have, in addition to Hector, we also have our Carbone, might be Carboni, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, sorry, in 2014, and then Pasiakos in 2010, who they, they did a sim, similar study design looking at muscle protein synthesis and breakdown in response to a deficit, but in leaner people. And they see that not only is protein synthesis suppressed, but muscle protein breakdown increases which probably comes back to what I said earlier, is that when you are leaner, you have less available body fat to mobilize for energy, and therefore you're actually gonna be tapping into amino acids for energy to a greater degree, uh, you know, glucose, and then using energy for gluconeogenesis to preserve uh, blood glucose and glycogen. So essentially, when you are talking about dieting for a contest prep, and you're getting really, really lean, you're hit on both sides of the equation. So there is absolutely a point where it would make sense to potentially drop volume. Um, but you don't need to have, uh, you know, radio, radioactive isotope muscle protein, you know, tracers in, in, in your body to determine this. You just gauge it the same way you would in the off season. How is my recovery? How are things going? Like, am I really sore, beat up, under-recovered? Do I start the next workout feeling like I, I haven't had enough time before the last one where I trained the same muscle groups or movements? So I think this needs to be something that is individualized, and scaled and changes over time. However, it is also true that there is no difference between the way we maintain muscle and gain muscle. It is again, coming back to this protein turnover, net muscle protein balance, the difference between net synthesis and net breakdown results in are we gaining, losing, or maintaining muscle mass. So it is not a new equation once you're in a deficit. You do have to do a stimulative training session to gain muscle, to offset whatever you'd potentially lose. And like I said, maybe early in a, in a diet, or maybe if you're high in body fat, you can actually grow muscle. Um, however, so, so therefore, we need to be doing hard training. We need to be getting the most stimulus we can out of our session. But that doesn't mean do the most amount of volume. And it doesn't mean that in the off-season either. You have to be able to recover and benefit from the volume you're doing. And the amount of recovery capacity you have is potentially less. So often, what this looks like is that for the first, let's say, quarter of the diet, you're basically training the same way you would in the off season, assuming you're not crash dieting. And then as you get into that halfway point, maybe three, three quarters of the way through, and then as you move towards the end, you're starting to see slight volume reductions while you're trying to maintain that appropriate proximity to failure. And this, this meets all of those various caveats that we've talked about. It treats the deficit as something that scales and that's affected by both acute and chronic uh, energy availability. 
It treats the training as a two-factor model that is both improving fitness but also affecting fatigue. And it gives us the understanding that volume is the amount of the stimulus that you can benefit from, not two different things that you need to compare head to head. And you go, all right, so then I want to have the volume as high as I can to get a benefit out of it, which is individual to me, related to something I do in the off season, and then affected by my change in recovery status over time. So yeah, that's it's, it, uh, in my opinion, it's relatively straightforward. And this is uh, a challenging thing to, so, so what I've done is I've constructed a logical argument, Omar, and I've brought in uh, mechanistic research and related research areas to explain each step of my logic train. But it's not like I have a study here, and this, is, this should be emphasized, where I'm like, hey, we took a group that increased volume, and we took a group that decreased volume while they're in a diet, and then we saw the outcome, and now we know empirically, which, which is better. We don't have that, which is, I think, an important uh, final point to say. So don't be like, you know what? Eric Helms dropped the science. I know the truth, yeah. capital T, uh, and that's the way it is. Eric, I love the uh, caveats that you provided there. I will say, like our boy Andrew Vygotsky in the previous episode, when he talks about best practices in the absence of you know strong scientific evidence, you being scientifically inclined, you coaching also, taking a look at all the available data, and then also having a large group, a really large uh, cohort, both with yourself and in general with uh, Team 3DMJ. So you're interacting with a lot of athletes. These are best practices that use the research you can extrapolate, your experience, and then synthesizing it together, which is ultimately, I think, what the aim is. So I pre- I, I love the uh, the uh, caveats that you're providing. We're like, well, I should I should say this, but but I do think. Um, when we have this conversation and when you also uh, talk specifically, because I, I think the people that we're ultimately talking to, I like how uh, sometimes you need to take something to its logical endpoint. So I think dieting down for a show is the most arduous of conditions where you can really test these things out. Because again, if you're in a 5% deficit, so it, it to me, it gives increased emphasis or, or, or credibility to some of the things or uh, some of your observations. Because you're in a 5% deficit, cool story, bro. You're losing five or eight pounds. You're pro- There's a lot of things that you can do that won't directly impact anything. When your recovery is impacted by such a severe calorie deficit, you have to get uh, uh, more wise with your approach. You have to almost gamify the system. You have to adapt and use best possible practices. And that's just one side tangent that I couldn't help but thinking. And I don't know if you agree with the statement when and I, I thought about it when you said yourself, either epigenetically something's occurring or also like you're just you know, used to the mental state from being in a deficit for a while, I kind of would put forth that as humans, we naturally almost like gamify things over time as we mm-hmm. understand what one must do. And I can say for myself, like one of the factors, once again, that legendary 2019 uh, run where I got I got down to 18% body fat, bro. But one, bro, you need everyone's seen your picture. Seventeen point four percent or not? Nah, you walking around all the time between uh, twenty and twelve percent. My man, my well, Eric, that's you. But what I was gonna say, uh, uh, guide into the light, is that uh, we talk about recovery. Uh, so the one point I did want to bring up, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this. We talk about recovery like it's a set amount, or or that obviously over time yeah. it gets eroded as fatigue increases, but. I would say, at least for myself, that when I start a a fat loss phase or I start a journey, I'm not necessarily using best practices for recovery. And what I mean when I say that, I like as a human, my sleep hygiene, my sleep quality isn't the best. My overall management of stress, I am uh, fallible. I am a human. I am. I'm likely to get like overstressed about various things. When I start in a fat loss phase, though, and I know it's only going to get more and more difficult over time. I actually kind of tick those boxes so the proverbial recovery bucket actually increases compared to what it'd be like in a surplus because you could mask fatigue when you're in a surplus. I could take the caffeine. I could stay up late at night. I could get into like an argument or whatnot. It's like very stressful and it won't affect my performance. But at the same time, when I start getting more serious, it's almost like I'm applying the same effort in the gym, but I'm increasing the effort outside of the gym to provide that kind of uh, proper cascade of not preventing the deleterious effects from affecting everything else. Yeah, and I, I would say that that's, that's not a guarantee that that happens, but yeah. it is extremely common. Yeah, I think it's common among bodybuilders. It's a common among anyone who takes it seriously that you're in contest prep mode now, right? Yeah. Um, and even more directly, instead of talking about kind of these vague 
behavioral things that that are probably going to be individual where you're like no you know what it's, it's more critical now that i maintain muscle or that i do things right because i have a set endpoint. like on this day i'm doing a photo shoot or i'm getting on stage and 100 percent um it is not uncommon at all for people to do things more effectively and more consistently when in that state because now they have an external goal driving them there they have accountability they might have hired a coach uh, and they're just thinking about everything through the lens of i'm on contest prep or yeah. i'm dieting so i think that absolutely does happen but even without those vague behavioral things, what often happens is that people start doing cardio, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and I know for me, like in the peak of my off season before I start prep, I'm not doing cardio. Yeah. Uh, so it is not uncommon at all that you actually get in like better cardiovascular shape. You're generally more active. And there is absolutely data to suggest that enhances recovery. Yeah. There's an interesting uh, phenomenon in uh, injury rates in athletes where there is actually a inverted U-shaped curve. So when you see athletes get really, really inactive, they go through periods of inactivity or detraining, it actually increases their risk of injury. Just like when they go through periods of extremely high levels of activity on the other side of that U-shaped curve, they're at a higher risk of injury. So you can actually get this detraining effect uh, where you get less resilient. Because remember, we're, we're not cars. It's not like you know, the, the more we drive, the more it wears down the bolts, the shock absorbers, and we got to take her in for an oil change. Rather, we're this continuously adaptive organism. So if we tell our body, you know, all I need to do is lift weights four times a week and sit on my butt and watch YouTube, you're not that resilient. Like you can handle what you're doing and you may actually see a higher injury rate than when you're clocking, you know, seven to 10,000 steps a day, you're doing two dedicated cardio sessions and you're training five days a week during contest prep. Likewise, if you were to go, you know what, I'm going to start training every day, doing cardio every day, you would probably then fall on the other side of that where you're actually more likely to get hurt again. So absolutely, Omar, I would agree with you that you may even find that your recovery improves when dieting. Like I said, it's very possible that someone with like, there, there is no off-season shirt, doesn't have this experience, and they're just living the life and they're trying to do things as optimal as possible, 24-7, and... If that's the case, more power to you, and then that probably won't apply. Um, but uh, going back to your your last uh, speaking period, the the first thing you opened with was how it was important for me to build this kind of logical set of, set of uh, steps so that people can understand the rationale behind it, and then backing it up also with the anecdotes of coaching. I will I will tell you one of the reasons I did that is because there is a publication that came out just last month that purports to have answered this question. Uh, and it is a open access, so you can check it out, uh, by Roth, Schoenfeld, and Behringer, so, so Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Uh, and it is a review uh, that in, in European Journal of Applied Physiology titled Lean Mass Sparing and Resistance Trained Athletes During Caloric Restriction, The Role of Resistance Training Volume. And in the abstract, it specifically says, and this is a review, so it's not, again, there's, there still is not that empirical study I, I suggested, um, but this is a study uh, of, of other studies. You know, it, it's not, a, it's systematic-esque. It's not a true systematic review. Like, I don't think it was registered and, and followed Prisma guidelines or any of that stuff. So it's not a super high quality of evidence. It is just a narrative review. But there are definitely people out there, especially if they're just a little more focused on kind of quote unquote science or hashtag science where they're like, oh, here's a study. It's on this topic. Here's the conclusions. It's experts. So they're probably right. And they actually say, um, that in, in, in uh, I will quote it from the abstract. Uh, the data appear to suggest that increasing resistance training volume during caloric restriction over time might be more effective in ameliorating uh, calorie restricted induced atrophy in both male and female resistance training athletes when compared to studies reducing resistance training volume. Now, I think, like, I do appreciate that the authors wrote this review, uh, and I think it's great that the discussion's out there, so I don't want it to sound like a knock. But this attempt at writing a narrative review or almost a systematic review on this topic, I don't think it should have been a systematic review. Um, if people aren't aware, systematic review, it answers a specific research question, not necessarily quantitatively. Uh, all meta-analyses are systematic reviews, but not all systematic reviews have a meta-analysis, but they have specific inclusion criteria. And you typically do something like, quote unquote, vote counting, where you go, OK, I found 10 studies and I want to know whether caffeine improved strength you know, eight of them said yes, two of them said, you know, it's, it's unclear, so it probably does. Or uh, five of them said yes, one said no, and four said it was unclear. 
it's leaning in the favor of potentially improving it, but I'm curious as to why there's a negative effect this one time, more data is needed. That's kind of the approach that you, you, you would, or that's the outcome you hope to get from a systematic review. Yeah. This body of literature, absolutely not suited for that. Instead, it probably should have been what I would describe or what is described as a scoping review, where you do a review to describe the scope of the literature and you identify gaps, holes, and you do a review specifically about what the literature can and can't tell us rather than directly saying what the literature tells us. So the research questions in this, re in this review by Roth and colleagues was trying to find out kind of twofold things that got really blended and unclear when you actually read the paper as to whether higher volume programs are more effective than lower volume programs for lean mass retention while dieting, and then whether increases or decreases were more effective. And they start to muddy the water. Like when you read this study, you're like, hold on, are we talking about an increase or are we talking about a higher volume comparing two mm. groups or two case studies? And they are not synonymous. And they, like, if you think about it, you could have those two things going in opposite directions, right? So as an example, the way they classify high volume studies versus moderate or low volume studies, it's the same way that Schoenfeld classified them in the meta-analysis on volume that's relatively well known. 10 plus sets is considered high volume, right? Well, that's high volume in a meta-analysis in the literature. That's not high volume for most bodybuilders. I'd say it's on the yeah. low end of normal, right? So you can absolutely have a finding where, yeah, these higher volume programs seem to be, quote unquote, higher volume programs seem to be better for lean mass retention, especially considering a lot of the studies in the systematic review were case studies and case series of competitive natural bodybuilders dieting. And those were also compared to people dieting just in more, more general resistance train studies, which again is a tough comparison for, for all the reasons we've talked about. So if we're looking at like the volumes often used by highly trained physique competitors, they're all gonna be high. And so therefore you can justify, oh, high volume is better, but, but you can have high volume and still have decreased it from even higher, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's one potential flaw. Another thing is like, the vast majority of the studies which they use to answer the question of whether there was an increase or a decrease in volume, they don't quantify volume the same way. Uh, and sometimes you, you don't even know what they did before they entered the study. It's kind of like more like did the periodization program result in a decrease or increase in volume? And you can have changes in volume that are changes in volume load while set volume doesn't actually change. And as we talked about, since load is not important but proximity to failure, whether you do a set of eight with 80%, or a set of 12 with 70%, yeah, a set of 12 with 70% is more volume load, but it's not more volume, quote unquote, if that proximity to failure is similar in terms of the stimulus for your muscles. So the, uh, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but I, I just don't think this review could answer the research questions it set out to do, and I don't think it is very clear. Um, this is something that if you want to check out the recent issue of Mass, Dr. Trexler did a great job reviewing it. Uh, we had a lot of peer review on this one because it was just a, it was a really muddied set of data. I think the authors did a, the best they could with the data, but we don't have studies comparing changes in volume. We're comparing like a group of eight non-bodybuilders to one case study and then saying which one was higher, you know, and, which is not a valid comparison. So it's, it's, it's a really challenging uh, research question to answer with the current state of the, the literature. And I just don't think we have an answer yet. But I don't think it's fair to conclude that uh, increasing volume is better than decreasing volume at this stage. So, Eric, yeah, you would say at most with the current available literature, something like a scope review, as you would uh, uh, classify, it would make more sense than this attempt because there, there's simply just not enough quality information or studies to go off of to try and start piecing out the various uh, parts of, you know, determining this answer. Absolutely. A scoping review is exactly what you need. It's, it's you go like, hey, we're interested in what is the state of the literature on the topic of volume changes in response to dieting? And then you could write about all the things I just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting to me because I do appreciate, you know, uh, someone or uh, individuals trying to answer the question. But then there is kind of holding up, uh, you know, a question to what we know thus far, best possible practices that we spoke about, which can't be immediately discounted. Sure. And the hierarchy of evidence, they uh, it might be uh, lower, but you can piece together a coherent logical train, uh, uh, a set series of arguments. We also do know from different, as much as I uh, tried to 
joke about let's say either like strength athletes or the pursuit of like weight optimization uh for strength performance there are various pieces that we know we have we have enough observational i'd say information on of uh, practices let's say uh as it relates to powerlifters or whatnot that some things even if this is the extrapolated you know conclusion and you might hear something like well wait wait a second here this is a pause for reflection because while there might be missing pieces of available literature we do have on another tier uh, certain evidence or stitching together uh, various parts. So I do I do find it interesting where I think that in the headline generation, you could just read something like that. And, you know, Eric, I hate that uh, old uh, adage now. It's like, well, there's a there's a review of everything or there's a study for it. I'm like, that's not how it works in the slightest. Like, what are we actually talking about? What question are we attempting to answer? Do we actually answer this question? What are the missing gaps here? And where do we need to go to further actually examine the question that we're attempting to answer? And I think when you take and one thing, sorry, very quickly that I like that we attempt to do on Iron Culture that you do so eloquently is to bring the listener along in terms of how do we answer these questions? How do we go about attempting to answer these questions? What do we know so far? Why is it that we know this amount? What are those missing gaps? And how can we hope to answer them in the future? As opposed to saying like, all right, slap hands, lick slips. This is the meta-analysis here. Done. We got like old guru style. It's like, we got them. We got them, boys. Uh, so I do appreciate that that is always like kind of the the subtonic of the conversation that follows people along. So by the time we come here, like even as you're talking about the distinction, like, okay, like it should be more like a scope review. As you're as you're just illuminating a little bit about uh, parts that like, okay, like it was this necessarily the best choice. The listener can hear like, okay, yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And actually, that that's probably a, a good next step is like, what would we need to do to answer this question? Of course, it would be great to just have a study where we took two groups, one decreased volume, the other didn't. Um, or we took a series of groups and we just had them at different volume levels. But I think an important thing we have to realize here is it needs to be relative to something you were doing when you were not in a deficit mm. to actually answer this question. Yeah. And a lot of the studies like in this in this review, they defined, well, they didn't have operational definitions for increasing volume or decreasing volume or even using progressive overload. They were relatively unclear. Um, but really what we care about is relative to the off season. That's what defines the increase or decrease. So we need to recruit people discuss with them how much they're doing in the off season, then look at changes relative to that to answer this question. Now, Eric, I, I think it's, it's very interesting when we have these conversations, because from the outset, it's a seemingly simple question that someone's asking. They basically want to know the best practices to arrive at their goal. Fair enough. But the necessary preconditions to answering the question is almost like an intake form. Like what were you doing beforehand? Okay. That helps determine in the future, the future course of action. And I think also, uh the idea uh, that i uh, just had to me it also highlights uh either answering the questions yourself over time and being able to piece out pieces uh, information out or the true value of a very good coach like quite frankly to help you navigate this perilous path a uh, path of trying to answer these questions when there is a lot of factors to consider and especially that's what we joked about being uh spendthrift boys where you know, you you can give someone with the best available uh, information if you don't know enough about them, their prior history, or probably what way they'd be leaning towards uh, a set series of guidelines that would would be counter uh, 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 the counter example to something that they should follow along with. And I find that interesting that you really need to answer all those questions to establish a base, move forward, test it out, and then see how one responds as opposed to like. Once again, slap hands. This is the answer right here. I do like that logic train that you provided. It's like if you want not to, as you uh, joked, we're not going to bury the lead. Here's what you got to do. Or here's like probably the best uh, recommended practices and go from there. But you see how it leaves more than enough wiggle room for someone to try and apply it to themselves and understand how it would work then for them. Absolutely. And I think it really just comes down to the same way you monitor recovery, diet or not diet is what you need to think here. It needs to be individualized. It needs to scale to where you were and where you're going. Um, and and yeah, I think it's, I do understand people who do the default reduction in volume. I've heard some smart people who I agree with who will agree with everything I'm saying, but go, I still think people should just reduce it because people do get more neurotic, less objective, sure. and more tied up into their emotions while dieting. So sometimes the 
the decision to reduce volume is maybe the best thing you can do, like blanket statement in a state where you've lost objectivity. And that's yeah. fair enough. But I do think a better solution would probably be to to put your training and your nutrition in the hands of someone who you trust, like a coach or, you know, a trusted fellow athlete or something like that. Yeah, man. all, all I could say, I uh, perhaps I'll find out I've been speaking with the nipples this year or uh, mayhaps next year to get to just that Eric flirting, flirting below 10 percent body fat, 9.8 and then dip right back up. Um, but your ability to no one's impartial when it comes to themselves. But your viewpoint being tethered to some aspect of reality, like how you see yourself, slowly, I can only assume, gets eroded as you're microanalyzing how you look, how you perform. And that is why I think, to me, in my head, why I love the idea of having either a coach or someone to bounce ideas off of or check in like like you, like you <laughs> you have all the information, all the level of knowledge required, but you'll still check it like with a veteran, like, hey, bird, or like, How's this photo look or whatnot? Just so your aspect, the calibration between your perspective and probably what is going on, on the outside align, because I could see immediately that misalignment occurring like within myself, you know, you're you're 14 weeks in. Oh man, I feel so flat. It's like that's normal. It's okay also that you're not looking the way that yeah. you should be looking. You gotta stay the core. Well, should I change it? And in that, in that, I would call it a vulnerable state because it's not only your perception of yourself. Is that due to the deficit you're in, you're you're a little bit more emotionally fragile. Like you might be cultivating some stoicism and like everything else and like resilience and all those very strong things that we talk about, but you're not necessarily coming from the most uh, robust position. Yeah, I can tell you with contest prep, it is accelerating towards an existential threat, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> While being dieted, you know, like you've put all this time and energy into you know your sport, and then. The closer you get to the competition, the more you're focusing on the ways you're not ready rather than the successes and you're losing objectivity. And you're also in a semi-starved state to where all that's getting compounded by true physiological changes. So it pays yeah. to have somebody in your corner, Omar. Man. Now, Eric, so you know what's funny? I think you hit so many of the talking points and damn, we managed to do it in just about an hour and 20 minutes, which shocks me hey. because... That, no, I just saying, hey, yeah. like, I'm just impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that Eric, I was like, he's about to say something because I know no, like, we I'm joke. Not. I'm just impressed with our timing. Yeah. Hey, we uh, we uh, we joke because there's that other podcast that basically you'll notice it's going to go from an hour. It used to be two hours or some such time to an hour to probably 30 minutes to this hour has 22 minutes uh, towards like a 30 second TikTok video. Uh, whereas for us, you're always guaranteed basically about 90 minutes which is the universally agreed upon why do you think films reach a certain run length time because it puts you on an emotional journey as well as an intellectual journey that you arrive at a certain place of self-awareness by the end of it that you can't rush eric and as, as try as they might like the, the corporations or the machinations behind the scenes they're trying to figure it out like okay well if we could just pump out two more episodes and we make them 45 minutes long that's four more times we can mention macro factor on the other hand for us we're like uh we don't we don't get paid for this, so we're just here to have a good time. So take it or leave it. It's a good thing. It's a bad thing. It's a terrible thing. It's for you to decide. Yeah, it won't be long until they're, they're back to two-hour episodes, but it's 15 minutes of content and an hour and 45 of ads. <laughs> kind of like the, like back in the, the heyday when the magazines were their worst with the muscle yeah. tech yeah. ad articles that were interspersed with the real articles. Yep, good times. Eric, with the spin too, like, you know, because like, marketing, people can be so slimy. We listen to you. So here's going to be the headline, folks. Don't get don't get uh, uh, swooned by, you know, the marketing jive. We listen to you hour long views were tanking and we understand you want two hours worth of content. Well, here at we're bringing back two hours worth of content. Meanwhile, it is now, as you said, 15 minutes of actual information, an hour, 45 minutes of shilling out like how to add McDonald's into your like uh, food item list. With, with uh, two clicks of a button instead of three clicks or like whatever it is. Well, like I said, we will be here on Iron Culture every week <laughs> judging other podcasts for doing <laughs> Thank you. what we hope we could do if we would just get <laughs> sure. those corporate sponsors. Yeah. And at that point, we will remove all canon comments about that not being okay and just fully <laughs> lean into shilling the crap out of ourselves. Thank you. So you Thank can you. look forward to that, folks. Hey. Every single Monday, I want to thank everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. This is stupendous because we've had now 
basically two monster episodes in the span of due to that scheduling conflict i don't know how the algorithm works i don't know uh itunes uh it was confusing but nonetheless we had an episode a few days ago if you haven't listened to it go ahead and check it out another one so that's two monster episodes in four days you could go ahead leave that rating review let them know let them know what you think and we're not trying to tell you what to think because of course we wouldn't do that we believe in the autonomy of the individual but everyone else all the cool people gave five stars so form your own conclusions but they should be informed conclusions and we'll see you every single monday from now until the end of time